there are many reasons why product categorization is important for e-commerce and marketing. Through the accurate classification of your products, you can increase conversion rates, strengthen your search engine and improve your site's Google ranking. Understanding this, we have come up with this tutorial on product categorization using machine learning. Now before we go ahead with the session, I'd like to inform you guys that we have launched a completely free platform called as Great Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI, Cloud and Digital Marketing. You can check out the details in the description below. All right, uh, so let's jump into uh, this topic. So uh, let's let's see what is product categorization and why does it really matter? So let's first understand what is product categorization. You must have seen uh, uh, browsed, you know, uh, sites like Amazon, Flipkart, and some of the other uh, social sites where you will see that there are, there are lots and lots of products. They are stuffed, they are grouped, and they are displayed for you to shop, right? Uh, in order to give you a, a great shopping experience, a seamless shopping experience, I think product categorization is very important. So this is about the, the customer side, you know. If you look at the organization, within the organization, we have lots of uh, functional departments. So for example, engineering department or, or the marketing department. The products uh, which engineering department creates, right? Those products are digitized in the form of uh, bill of material, the BOM. And they are actually stored in the engineering database most of these databases, if you're aware are like uh, product life cycle management systems like team center or there are some plm systems from the sol system so 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 engineering will have their own management systems and then once the product is uh, ready to go in customer hands then the data actually gets transferred to the business systems. So business systems are mostly the ERP databases like SAP, Oracle, etc. So whenever we do this transition from the engineering to the business, I think that's one area where this categorization becomes hugely, hugely important. Because if your mapping is not right, then I think your data that you keep in your organization is actually not right. The third thing is uh, if you look at the, uh, if you if you had visited any manufacturing plant or a uh, big big building uh, or you know some some sort of oil plants, so you must have noticed. Let's say if you go to a hospital or if you go to uh, some school, right? So you must have noticed that you know the assets, you know, for example, they have let's say manufacturing scenario. They have a lot of machines, right? And they have assembly lines. Then they have a lot of sensors, a lot of subsystems. So all these assets are actually, you know, managed in a particular order. So they are nothing but, uh, you know, a sort of grouped into a category. So, so that's another area where, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we can map, let's say we can map a sensor to a system, right? Sensor X, Y, Z, I should be able to map to a system ABC, right? some valve i should be able to map to to another system so so this is another area where the product categorization is hugely hugely important so what we do uh, basically when we categorize a product we essentially we create a signature of a product you know how can we traverse uh, some sort of data points so that we can uh, reach to a product definition now, what's the business impact? You know, why does it really matter? So, as I've told you, one case that, you know, the good shopping experience in case of e-commerce uh, setup. Now, in case of uh, the engineering versus business uh, mapping, data mapping setup, I think it is important because if the business data is not right, your financial reporting is not going to be right. And that means uh, you're not really giving right correct numbers to your shareholders, to your customers, and so on. So it really badly impacts your business. Okay, so this I've already told you about the bad shopping experience. And then it all boils down to 
you know how do we organize and digitize your products so that you know uh, all the other dependent systems you know do not face challenges and they work seamlessly okay um, and if we do that through machine learning you know also you know add some automation on top of it then i think we can also save a lot of uh, manual labor time and the cost so this is pretty much in nutshell you know uh, what is product categorization and why does it matter now i'll give you some snapshots on what we are talking here so this is what we mean about the product so let's say the product is for example, Sherwani, right here. So it is categorized in the group ethnic wear, and then you see a hierarchical product category. So ethnic wear is actually linked to the men's category, and the final uh, top level category is clothing. So this is one kind of uh, product categorization which has to get right, otherwise, it's going to give you a lot of challenges business wise. So what do we generally, what do we get uh, in our data sets? So, so we generally have data sets like, you know, what is, let's say uh, the product number, let's say for Sherwani, maybe they have assigned a product number. They have assigned some description. For example, here, the description is Sherwani 362. Or if we combine this description with the, uh, with the top level uh, layer, then we can say, ethnic wear share one in 362 right so this type of description is it's like a textual description it's very unstructured description and then you can have some other uh, data for example which supplier is is giving you this uh, um, this product and where this product is getting manufactured what is the color material and so you may have you know lots of lots of features related to the product as part of your meta metadata uh, which can be used to build the machine learning models, machine learning uh, solution, right? Now, nowadays, you know, we also use uh, image of a product uh, along with the metadata. Now, you know, at times the image uh, really, really benefits a lot in terms of uh, categorizing a product, but at times it may not, right? So, at, so it's it's always uh, like a a good balance between the metadata and the image data. So in this particular session, I think we are not going through a, a, a case study with an image because uh, uh, image generally uh, leads us to, you know, this uh, deep learning concepts like convolution, network, or uh, uh, and so on. And we have to talk about, you know, the the bound the bounding boxes and the segmentation, etc., which is like which is a little advanced topic. So we will not talk about it, uh, but we will go through uh, the approaches which we can adopt with the metadata, you know, with, the, uh, with an unstructured and unstructured, you know, sort of mixed kind of a data. So what are the key challenges? So as you would have already uh, anticipated, you know, large number of categories is, is, a, is a big challenge. Okay, and the unstructured nature of data, as I told you, that's it's, it's highly textual data, and you have, uh, uh, you know, lots of categories. So that's why you have very high cardinality. So cardinality is nothing but that the number of categories or number of levels you have uh, in your feature. Okay, and then, uh, you know, another uh, challenge, which is even bigger challenge, is that. A lot of times uh, the new products are introduced. Uh, so basically this, this whole process really becomes a, a dynamic process where you have to keep refining your model. You have to keep retuning your model so that you can take care of some of the new products which are getting introduced. So, so these are the key challenges to develop a solution around, around these, uh, these problems. Okay, so what, what can we do about it? So, um, so we'll go through a case study, but I'll tell you uh, what are the uh, steps we will go through uh, in an orderly fashion. So first we will take you through uh, the pre-processing, you know, how do we uh, sort of clean up the data and pre-process it. And then we will discuss about some of the feature selection strategies uh, like unigrams or biograms, uh, 
uh, which can actually help reduce the, the cardinality. Uh, okay, and then we will look at some of the tips and tricks, you know, how can we do better and faster model building? How can we make sure that the size of the model is not huge, considering the problem space is huge? So those type of tips and tricks, we will uh, go through it. And then we will uh, finally, you know, look at some of the, the models uh, and their results and how they stand with respect to each other. So this is overall uh, the strategy which I will be going through. So let's jump into the problem statement. So, so what I've, the problem statement I've taken is, uh, is that we already have engineering data and we want to, to move uh, to the business categories, right? So as I was I was telling you that, you know, engineering PLM system to the business PLM system. So let's say team center to SAP or team center to Oracle. Okay, so this is a problem statement here. So um, the case study, you know, I have about six columns so object type is like what is the type of the product whether it's a hardware or software and part or product it's it's like what is the number uh, it could be like number with uh, six digits seven digits you know it's 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 like an id of a part okay and then the part description is nothing but uh, how do you sort of textually describe the part for example which we looked at, uh, you know, Sherwani, uh, uh, you know, in the previous slide, you know, the Sherwani 362 linked to ethnic pair, linked to the men category and linked to the clothing category, right? So that type of description is what we have here in the part description or product description. Plant is, could be like a manufacturing plant or supplier plant uh, and center and code. Uh, center could be, you know, where, where the store is located and, and the code could be some sort of a uh, financial code uh, or something else. So, so this is uh, the data set which we are going to use as part of our case study. Now, apart from that, we have number of categories. So uh, I have taken uh, this case study with 37 categories. So it's not a huge number because I also have to uh, sort of make sure that you know i can run the code in my decks in my laptop so that you know uh, i can manage with the uh, with, with the pace right uh, in this presentation so but still 37 categories is something that's on a higher side which you will not generally encounter in your in your usual problems right in usual problems uh, i think what we what we do is we we work with four or five categories at the mass max okay and i've taken like eighteen thousand records now uh, i actually had uh, almost like two lakh records but i have done some uh, pre-processing outside basically i've looked at what categories are dominating the 80 20 rule right and i have only picked up those categories and the remaining categories i have put it in one group. So I've called it as I've given some number. So that's where you see that the number of records are, are also slightly less lesser. Okay. So here you should, uh, I would like to highlight that, you know, the cardinality for the part is about 16,000. So that means we have 16,000 different IDs in the data and the part description. So let's say if you have, you know, some sort of, uh, let's say share one or uh, or let's uh, let me just go back to the previous one i think that would be better yeah so part description is nothing but these type of descriptions now the jackets could be part of uh, the men uh, category as well as the women category right so some descriptions uh, you see could be common and that is why uh, you may notice that the description cardinality is is lower than the the part cardinality okay because uh, part has more uniqueness than 
than the description but still the cardinality is really really high almost like 7000 okay so um, but while the rest of the other uh, features you know have uh, comparatively very very low cardinality like less than 6 65 to 70 okay so overall if you see our data set you know the data set has almost like 25000 plus cardinality you know so 25,000 plus categories. Now, how do you deal with this type of data and how do you build the model? So that's really a challenging process. So, uh, so my plan is to take you uh, to the process uh, through this presentation from start to the end, and then I'll jump on to the R Studio and give you uh, a sort of a code run from top to bottom. And in that process, I think you will have a revision one more time, okay? So let's uh, first go through these slides to understand uh, what uh, what uh, we can do to handle to tackle these type of problems. Okay, so so on the on, on this chart you can see that these categories have uh, very different counts, right? So some categories have more counts and some categories have less counts. So their frequency chart. Uh, looks really, really skewed. And that's the real scenario because you're, you will have some products which are uh, selling higher as compared to the other products. And that's how this chart shows up. Okay. So, so once, so let's say if you're, if you're working on this problem, I think it's always good to look at this chart and see that uh, whether it actually meets the real, uh, real world situation or not. Okay, so on the left hand side, I've given you some counts, uh, but uh, this list is, is is not limited to the six categories that we discussed. There are uh, around 37 categories, so the list will go on, but I've just highlighted some of the top items in the list. Okay, so, so this is an example for, uh, of the data set. Okay, so you have as I told you, object type is uh, either hardware or a software, and some of the part numbers. The part number is nothing but the IG and the description, and these are some of the codes. And in the end, we have the categories. So, so essentially, this is what you see when you do a view of your data set in R Studio. Okay. Now, what can we do here? I think uh, our first objective should be to reduce the cardinality. Right, so, so simplify the number of categories so that we can handle it in our model later on, right? So a part description is unstructured, you know, it has a textual data, right? So I think we should look at some of the text mining approaches where we can do uh, the cleanup, you know, we tokenize it and we uh, sort of uh, clean it up and sort of extract uh, a subset uh, and so on so that you know we can make uh, simplify it and keep it ready for uh, for the feature engineering later on so so what i mean is that when we when we do a cleaning on, on the part description you know all these uh, alphanumeric letters can go away all these commas and punctuations can go away and and some of the uh, stop words like articles, you know, the, a, and, you know, those type of words can also go away so that we are ready with, uh, you know, the, the data that we need, you know, the data which has the most impact. Okay, so that's what we will do uh, in our exercise uh, in our studio. Okay. Now, when we do this pre-processing, I think we should uh, try to understand the nature of our data. So the so, so for example, in our in, in this particular case, on the left hand side, you see a box plot, right? So box plot tells you how many actual tokens or how many words you have in the product description or part description. And what is their distribution? So here you can tell uh, easily that a lot of parts have a description with let's say two or three words, right? Because the mean is about two or three, uh, sorry, the median. 
and but still you can see that uh, there are a, a good number of uh, part description where uh, the the total count is more than three or four or even five so there are some long uh, part description there are some short part description so that's what it tells you okay so uh, so this this is a good uh, a sort of a uh, chart uh, a visualization for you to understand how does your data uh, distribution look like okay now uh, the right hand side chart will tell you um, you know how your world frequency you know uh, the count uh, distribution will look like so once we tokenize it right and then we uh, try to calculate the frequency of every word in the in the in the product description or part description we can we can actually uh, plot a bar chart like this so what it tells me that uh, there is a lot of places you know assembly word uh, has appeared in the data set as compared to uh, the control or the unit okay so it tells me that uh, we have probably more assemblies right in our data uh, as compared to uh, the units right or as compared to the boards so it gives you uh, some sort of an idea you know what type of uh, products uh, are more common in the organization as compared to the others okay So after we have done uh, the cleanup and the tokenization, and we have uh, we have had a good understanding uh, about uh, you know these uh, descriptions, uh, then we can go with go to the next step, which is the feature selection. Now the feature selection, uh, the goal is to simplify uh, this entire space even further. Okay, because uh, once we tokenize, uh, the sentences will split into words, right? The description will split into words. So if I had only 18,000 records, 18,000 rows in my data, but once I split every row description into words, this number will outgrow to a huge, huge uh, uh, number. So, so as you can see that uh, uh, the number of tokens or the number of words have actually grown to 56,000 okay so now what we have to do is we have to actually reduce um, this space simplify this space so that you know we can reduce the cardinality overall cardinality of our of our part description feature or the product description feature so what uh, so there are various approaches uh, that we can take up uh, and one of the approaches uh, term frequency and inverse uh, document frequency tfidf um, I'm sure some of you will be definitely uh, aware of this uh, approach. It is pretty uh, popular approach in the text mining arena. So TFIDF, what it does is actually make sure that a common words uh, are actually ignored and the words uh, which, uh, you know, which kind of give the whole sense of the uh, uh, of each and every row should be kept okay so basically it ranks the uh, it, it assigns a score to every word and and ranks them from uh, in an increasing order right so that is what the tfidf does so basically what we can get is we can extract two or three words from the entire description uh, which are actually important for that uh, context for that description and ignore the remaining words uh, which will not really impact uh, us a lot uh, in the in the downstream process when we do the model building okay so this is essentially what it does now this two or three words is, is your your own choice right it depends on how do you want to decide based on your data and, and your business and your choice? So, but essentially it will simplify your space, 
okay now what i have done here is i have also further simplified i have joined these two or three words um, with the hyphen so basically converted into a single word so basically what what has happened is i have basically uh, the part description uh, i have created a new new part description uh, and mapped those uh, long sentences or short sen sentences to a single word okay now the single word is nothing but a join of two words with the underscore so this is what i have done so we will look at it once we jump into the r studio you know how does it work okay so nutshell uh, we have reduced the cardinality to a great deal so for the part description we have reduced it to from 7700 to 2450 and for the part uh, what we have done is what i've done is i've taken the first three digits of the id so that actually reduced the space considerably from 16,000 to almost like 500. So that means that you can essentially depict your part ID uh, in the same way if you take the first three digits and ignore the remaining digits because that's where most of the information lies uh, in your uh, in your part ID. Okay, so so that's how that so. So we have actually reduced the cardinality to a uh, to a great extent from 24 25000 to so 2500 almost like 10 times <clears throat> reduction so that's that's great but still we have a very high number you know 2450 categories or 500 categories is still a big number so we'll still have to do something more now let's jump into how do we actually uh, use uh, this high cardinal data into a model building right so one of the approaches that we use is a one hot encoding uh, so i'm sure some of you must have heard about encodings like label encoding and, and dummy dummy encoding or one hot encoding so essentially it is the same thing so label encoding actually assigns uh, the label one two three four in an orderly fashion Right. So label encoding works well when when you actually have an order in your data. Right. So let's say if there is a age feature, so you can have an order. Okay, it's a it's an infant or a young uh, young person or you know old person and and so on. So so label encoding uh, works pretty well if you have a, a order in your data. But most of the time, uh, the data that you get, high categorical data, will not have an order. So so there we actually end up using the one hot encoding. So one head hot encoding uh, will actually increase your feature space uh, considerably uh, because it will it will create a new feature for every category, right? So wherever that category is present, it will assign one, and it's not present, it will assign zero. So for example, in our in a problem in a case study, if we do a one hot encoding of uh, of our data sets we will end up with 2500 new columns 2500 new features okay that's what the one hot encoding is now we can still work with 2500 by using some of the algorithms but uh, you know a lot of algorithms other algorithms a lot of good algorithms uh, popular algorithms will actually not work very well with this uh, this uh, this much size of the data okay so uh, for example in this case when i did a split uh, train and test i was able to run uh, svm um, using uh, using this data with one hot encoding but when i tried applying other algorithms like uh, multi classification logistic algorithm or knn or some tree-based model like decision trees or random forest or XGPost. You know, none of the algorithm actually worked. Most of them have actually given me exception that, uh, you know, it, the, the size is large and they are not able to allocate memory and they're not able to run it. Okay, so if you have a, a very high 
uh, n systems with a lot of RAM and, and too many number of cores, then of course you can actually run some of them. But in reality, that may not be available even in the enterprise setup, you know. So generally, you will not have access to, let's say, a 10 cores or 20 cores, or you will not have access to 256 uh, sort of uh, GB of, of friend, right? So generally, you will uh, you will have, you know, laptops with 16 GB RAM and maybe two, two to four number of cores. So it, it really depends, but in most of the scenarios, uh, we may not be able to use uh, a lot of algorithms uh, with this type of setup. So what can we do about it? So let's look at some of the tricks which we can apply. Okay, so before uh, I jump into the, uh, to the other approach that we can apply, let's look at some of the results which I've got from SVN. So here you can see that um, I've got I've got accuracy scores, precision recall, and FN score. So some of the items you can clearly notice, for example, DJ has a very high uh, accuracy and the F1 score, right? CA has a very high, almost like one. And some of them have low F1 score, even though the accuracy seems almost seems like 10, 10 point higher than the F1 score. So one thing I would like to tell you that when we talk about multi-classification, right? So as a multi-classification, uh, we can look at the accuracy score or F1 score to, to judge uh, the performance of the model. But when we have to look at each and every individual classes, I think we cannot use accuracy as a metric. Why? Because there is uh, uh, the nature of uh, imbalance of the data, right? So your, your data is not really balanced. That means your positive category, your positive and negative categories are not balanced, right? So you have, for example, class AD, you may have only 500 records which belong to AD out of 18,500 records, overall records, right? So, so that way the, the you know, if, if we talk about the individual class, uh, we have to actually consider the imbalanced nature of the data and that is why the accuracy is not preferred. We always have to go for some other type of metrics like F1 score or the uh, ROC, you know, AUC metric. Okay, now if you want to explain uh, your results for such type of problem statement where you have high cardinality, right, uh, number of uh, columns or number of features are really, really high, or more like 3,000. So your size is really high. So one of the approaches you can use to actually explain or to investigate, uh, to understand your data further is use the T-SNE plot. Now, if you see the T-SNE plot here, I can clearly see that there are some, you know, very isolated kind of clusters, let's say black color, which is DJ. So DJ is very isolated. And that makes sense because if we go back to a previous slide, we see that uh, the DJ, you know, accuracy and F1 score is actually pretty high for both uh, test and train. So that means this particular category, uh, it's easy to identify because uh, it's really, really uh, different, isolated from the from the rest of the rest of the data. So likewise, actually, you can in investigate and look at uh, how your how your data can be visualized. So, so uh, on the contrary, if you see the BT category, there are uh, the red dots which are scattered all over, and some of them are in the close proximity of uh, the other type of categories. So it it clearly shows that it's it's not going to be easy for you to actually uh, define a clear uh, a boundary. For, uh, for the BT type of category in your classification approach. So this is just to give you an idea, you know, what are the different tools and techniques you can use in order to understand your data better. Now, once you have some clear, uh, let's say in the previous slide, we, uh, okay, let me just go. Yeah, 
So previous slide, we have seen that, you know, the BT has a very clear uh, uh, cluster and some of the, uh, let's say the green one, the CA has a very clear cluster. So what we can do is we can further look at, uh, you know, how, how the data dependency, you know, how the data uh, is sort of, what is the decision which decision rule which we can build in order to identify that cluster very very clearly so in that case what you can do is you can use one versus all approach right where you can see where you can say that uh, my outcome flag you know my my dependent variable is actually bt and wherever there is no bt i will change it to zero and wherever there is a bt i'll change the flag to one so it becomes like one versus all so you are now uh, you have now reshaped your data so that your BT is always one and the remaining categories are zero. So, so that approach you can use and you can build a decision tree to actually look at, clearly get an insight about how your decision rule is working for the category BT because uh, the cluster is, is uh, isolated, you know, it's, and we are able to classify it with a high degree of accuracy. So if you have to show to your to your business uh, business teams that you know how does BT work you know um, with respect to the data, you can actually use this one versus all approach and sort of extract the rule and 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 show them that this is how it looks. So it is it's just a, it's just a, going to help you to explain your model better to understand your model better. Now let's jump into what we can do in order to reduce you know, in, in order to overcome this challenge so that we can use other algorithms. So some of the techniques what we can use is we can use the chi-square or Fisher uh, stas statistical methods uh, to uh, actually look at the, the features which are important, right, with respect, to, with respect to the categories, right? So it's always X versus Y. So that's what the chi-square text does for us. But you know the statistical methods, you know, they come with lots of assumption. So you have to make sure that the minimum number of uh, data points should be more than 10 or 20. You have to make sure that they follow some sort of distribution, et cetera, et cetera. So they come with a lot of, lot of assumption. So, but this is one area which, uh, which you can use and you can reduce uh, the size of your of your data. So maybe you may be able to reduce from 2,500 columns to 1,500 columns or 2,000 columns, but it will not reduce it any further. So it can give you 2x reduction, but it will not give you uh, more than that. Okay. We can also use uh, CAT PCA again, you know, because this is a one hot encoding uh, data. Uh, we can use CAT PCA. Uh, it's slightly different than uh, the, the, the usual PCA that we use. Um, but you will have a challenge, you know, because uh, PCA uh, will have a components which can explain your data to a certain degree, let's say 80% or 90%. How many of such components you want to keep and how do you want to define those, uh, those variables? So let's say if you, if you bring down your space from 2,500 to, to 1,000, it's very difficult to actually Put a, put a name or put an understanding to those features because they are the latent features. You don't know about anything, don't know anything about those features. So in that context, I think you have to really see whether it makes sense to use CAT PC in your business context or not. The other option is the mean encoding, or sometimes it's also called target encoding. Uh, that's, that's one of the popular methods which are used across industry, uh, across uh, uh, you know, practitioners, machine learning practitioners. So I'll talk about this method in a moment. And then there is a uh, there is a package called CAT Boost. It has come out from a university called Yandex. Uh, it's also gaining very uh, popularity nowadays uh, because it uh, it is specifically focused uh, to take care of these type of problems where we have a lot of categorical feature and we have high cardinality and big size of of the data set. So that is another option that, that you can use. In fact, I've used it and show, I'll show you the results also. So let's jump on to the mean encoding. 
now it's the very very simple methods but it is very very effective in terms of reducing the size now look at the right hand side chart what we are doing is we are trying to uh, see the association between the description versus the category so for example fuel control has four records and out of four two records a flag one and the remaining two a flag zero so so what is our uh, mean encoding value so mean encoding value would be uh, 2 divided by 4.5 so that's what we do very simple okay so what we have to do here is uh, just map the categories the feature with the category to your outcome variable which is a category in this case and then look at what is the dependency of this let's say in our case part description with the category now here the dependency is that out of four records you know two records are positive and two are negative so hence our mean encoding value would be 0.5 okay same with the ball bearing so here you see the ball bearing is zero so hence your mean encoding is zero so so what it tells you it tells you that ball bearing may not be really you know important feature for your model building because it does not have any impact on the on your model right so likewise you can actually create these mean encoding okay now what do you get out of it you see we have fuel control ball bearing controller and blank plate so we have four different categories right now in when we apply one hot encoding these four categories will give you three columns right because uh, it is like zero one for every category in the one hot encoding but what do you what do you get in the mean encoding you actually get only one column right and you have also sort of come out of the clutches of categorical nature of the variables you are actually defining a continuous variable here right through the mean encoding so it actually shoots you know it solves two things simultaneously one is that it reduces your number of features uh, which in the one hot and get case would have been three to one and if we, you had let's say ten a different part description in 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 here then it would have reduced from nine to one so basically for every column you have sort of one a mean encoding column and you you will not have too many sort of uh, columns for each and every category in your dependent variable okay so that's what it does so basically essentially it will reduce the size of uh, the data you're working with you're using to generate the model and it will finally also reduce the size of your model because the more dependency your model has with your data the more feature it depends to the size will also increase right the less number of features the size will also remain very slim right so so it actually helps you a lot in that context now there are some challenges working with mean encoding sometimes it can give you a data leakage uh, but there are few approaches i think you can uh, you can avoid that data leakage one of the approaches is to introduce some sort of a noise and that is what i've done uh, in the code and I'll, I'll show you that but but there are few other approaches like cross validation uh, smoothing so those approaches can also be used and it really depends uh, on uh, data to data and and the business context okay but this is this is like a huge huge uh, uh, change uh, from what we were doing earlier so it really helps us reduce the size of the data and it will help us to uh, to sort of implement some of the great uh, great algorithms and and sort of uh, improve the performance of model and improve the the performance of solution so that's what i've done so after doing this mean encoding i have looked at uh, i've been able to run uh, so many different algorithms like xgboost random forest gbm cat boost etc and this is how the performance chart looks like so in this particular uh, context you know in this particular case study you can see that the cat boost has the less amount of overfitting because the train and test both uh, are very close to each other right even okay. though uh, the performance is not not that great 
Uh, on the other end, if you look at the random forest, uh, you can see that the performance is uh, a lot better than the other algorithm, and the overfitting is uh, is also decent. You know, it's it's not they're they're still pretty close. So if I have to pick up a couple of models from here, I would pick up the random forest and cat boost. And then I would uh, try to fine tune the models by fine tuning their hyperparameters and see if I can get a, a performance even better. So that's pretty much uh, I'm going to cover in the R Studio. And this pretty much actually concludes uh, the case study, which we were permitted to, to, to kind of uh, to go through it. Now it's all is good, but I think uh, we can still do still do better uh, if you use the neural networks. So neural networks have uh, a concept which is quite similar to uh, encoding. We, we call it as the embedding. So especially the textual data and structured data, uh, we have some pre-trained em embedding which are readily available for neural network to use, and those embeddings can be used. And we can, in fact, improve the performance of model using neural network. And neural network will also help you to generalize because uh, those are like generic embeddings. So even if you have a different description later on, which is it does not matches with your existing data set, you will still get the embeddings. You know some embeddings, and you will still be able to categorize it uh, into one of the categories. So neural network actually helps you extend this concept further using the embeddings. So nowadays, neural networks are applied generally in most of uh, most of uh, these type of uh, problem sets. But since it's an advanced topic, and I think many of you have not gone through the neural networks or the deep learning concepts, so I have not really explained it here. So that pretty much concludes uh, our presentation. Uh, I hope that uh, I've been able to, to give you a good sense of uh, what you can do in um, in these type of problems. So I'll jump into the R Studio now and take you through the code. So in R, I think the first step is to sort of load the packages. So that's what is happening here. And then um, uh, load your data. So this is what I've done. Uh, and assign, assign some global variables. So these variables uh, I've used in the downstream steps uh, so basically, the first variable is about the length of the word. So any word which has length smaller than four, you know, I have ignored that word. So it is part of the um, pre-processing step, which we discussed in our slides earlier. And the max number of tokens, that means max number of words, which I have joined with the underscore. So that is uh, the two words is what I've defined. but it is not limited to two. You can, in fact, go to three and four also. So this is a hyperparameter that we can define as a global. And this is the max number of digits. So if you remember the part ID or the product ID, we have used the first three digits. So that's what it is. Uh, and this is a partition, test and train partition, so 80, 20. Uh, this is about the correlation. So any feature which is highly correlated, you know, greater than 90. 0.9, absolute value greater than 0.9 is, is, uh, will be ignored. So this is the global parameter for that. And this correlation, whether I need to run or not run, this is just a flag. I think I'm actually running the correlation always. So this is sort of redundant, okay? Now, these are some of the library functions which I have defined. Uh, let me just show you those functions. So they are nothing but some methods which, which I have used, for example, to count the number of words uh, in the description and how many unique words, uh, short word, uh, remove stop words, right? All the, so, so they're mostly uh, cleanup related functions. And some of the functions are related to the predictions. So what is the accuracy value of the prediction? And for GBM, I think we have to handle it slightly differently. So that's why the, the function is slightly different. And then replacing the NA or NAN values with the sort of imputation, imputing the missing value kind of a concept. So where I've replaced it with the mean. One versus all, you know, if you want to understand the metric of 
a particular category or particular class versus a multi-class so this is to understand the metric for for that so so these type of functions uh, uh, that i've defined in the library uh, so basically keeping the the code uh, and and the functions you know separate is, is an idea so let's run the global parameters uh, let's uh, source all the functions into this context and then let's run the data okay let's read the data and let's see the structure of the data okay so as i told you that i've just fetched the data so what you see here is the random names you know these are like a person person name so so in my slides you will find names like assembly or ball bearing and you know those type of uh, names which are actually uh, actual product description but since uh, you know i cannot share that that data uh, outside so i've just fetched it but overall the structure looks will be same okay so here you can see that description has some text and then you have plant and center which have some code and then categories so these are the categories you have the product numbers so product numbers or the part numbers are of six digits and that's how it and this is hardware and software object type so it's pretty much the same data which we had in a case study okay so I'll just remove some of the unnecessary data and then so i've just looked at whether there is an there is any null uh, so there are no uh, no null no missing values in the data especially in the product description so that's fine now this is how your categories uh, what is the data proportion of your category with respect to the entire uh, length of the data so you can see that most of the categories have like uh, two percent of the population uh, some categories are even less than one percent so there is a very high imbalance in the data and that's what we discussed right some categories have uh, 13 but uh, also 13 percent and 11 percent so there are some categories where uh, which are which are showing up more frequently which which have more data as compared with us but over and all i think a lot of data is is unbalanced so anything less less than five sorry great uh, yeah less than five is i would definitely consider as unbalanced so two to five percent or less than five uh, less than two to five percent is definitely unbalanced uh, five to ten percent you can still consider depending on the uh, overall uh, volume of your data uh, you may still like to consider it as imbalance or or, or or fair data that that depends on the on the context but generally less than five percent uh, two to five percent is considered yeah. as unbalanced so you can see it's a highly unbalanced or uh, imbalanced data okay so now let's look at some of the uh, pre-processing steps that we discussed so what we are doing here we are uh, replacing all alphanumeric like all digits uh, basically removing all the digits and removing the punctuations right and removing some extra spaces and then converting the text to the lower and then uh, unique words means uh, basically look at uh, some of the repetitions ignore some of the repetitions so that we we don't have to we don't have to in include them short words are like any word which has a length less than three or four uh, we ignore it here stop words are some of the common words like all the verbs is m r or the you know those type of words i think we will we will also ignore those and let us say if by doing all this cleanup we end up with a, a null string in our data then we will assign it to uh, some some unknown so here in this case i've just put it as short word miscellaneous 
So there might be cases where a description may have only one word and that word is length is less than three or less than four. So maybe your word is RES or ABD, you know, we don't know really. So those are some of the noisy words. So I think that's why we have removed it and replaced it with some sort of a predefined unknown string. So let's run this. So all these functions remove short words, remove stop words, unique words. Uh, unique word is a is not a function, but uh, some of the user defined functions uh, are part of this library function uh, R file. So they are already sourced into this environment. So I'll go through the, the next steps meanwhile. So now we are going to look at those box plots uh, and some of the word frequency after we do the tokenization. So here is what uh, uh, we'll see the box plot and and then we will see uh, the frequency of the words, you know, what words are most common versus the, the other. Okay, so this piece is run. Now let's look at the box plot where we can see uh, overall what is the size of our description, you know, how does it, how is it distributed? So, so you may not be able to match those picture one to one, you know, presentation versus the artboard because here the data is slightly fudged, okay? But overall structure would be uh, would be same. So here you can see that uh, some words are more than two or three, uh, have length more than two or three, that means we have more than two or three words. And some of the descriptions have even more than that. So there is a whisker, uh, so 25% of, I would say, data uh, has more than five, and then that is some, maybe one or two percent of the data, which has a very, very long, long description. So that's how it's, it looks. Now we will look at the frequencies. So basically what we have done here is we have created a data frame where we have the frequency versus uh, the name. Okay, so the name goes with the frequency. So let me run this. Okay, so that's how the data frame looks like. So you have the name of the word versus how many times it has appeared in your uh, corpus, in your data. And then look at plot. So that's how it, it looks. So here, uh, you know, you remember in, in our slice, it was assembly, which was uh, having the maximum frequency. So you can see that Jennifer is probably synonyms to assembly. <laughs> okay. So, but overall uh, tr uh, shape of, of this bar chart, I think structurally, if you see, it remains the same. So words have high frequency and then some words will have low frequency. But that's how it should look like. Okay, so now we jump into the feature selection where we are going to do a TDF, TF, IDF, right? Uh, term frequency and inverse document frequency. So that's where we are going to do here. Okay, so it's pretty fast. Uh, look at the plot, you know, how does it? So here, this plot, you can see that some words will have a very high ETF IDF score, and they are really, really important in terms of the context of the problem versus the other words which have the, the less score. So when we are trying to uh, reduce the size of the description to two words, so our focus would be to pick up those two words which have the high TF IDF score and then join them with the underscore. Okay, that's what we are going to do. Okay, so um, as you can see, I'm actually removing a lot of variables in between because, uh, you know, this is a huge data and all these variables, if I, if I keep them in the session, they actually take up a lot of memory. So, so I'm just dynamically removing the variables which are not required in the downstream process. Okay, so let's 
uh, transform the uh, PFIDF into data frame. And then let's go look at the score and how we can uh, sort of join those two words together. So this is the global variable, if you remember, is related to how many words we want to join. So in our case, we have taken this value as two, right? So it will pick up the two words and join them together, okay? Now, this is a function which will actually look at the TF-IDF score, okay? Now, the TF-IDF score, we can use three different approaches. So one is that we look at the uh, summation of score that is given to a word in every part description, or we look at their mean value or the max value, right? So either of these approaches we can use. Uh, we can also actually use uh, uh, their, so let me do one thing, let me just plot. I think I would have removed the PDN now. Okay, so in between, let's see if we can. All right, so this will turn off work. Yeah. So let me. Okay. So you can see that you know the this is the TD uh, TF IDF score that is assigned to the word, right? So every variable will every uh, row will have uh, this type of score. So what we can do is uh, let's say for for a particular word we can aggregate all the scores which are assigned to that word in a different row. So that word may appear at different places, right? And at those places, it may have a different score, right? So what we can do is either we can uh, aggregate that score or we can take a max. So whatever score is the max, right? Or mean, or we can take their individual score in the individual row. So that is what I mean to say. So it is up to us to decide. I think some iteration might be required for you to fully understand uh, what is best uh, for the context of the problem. Okay, so, so let me just run this first, and then I will run this. So this is a very important step. That's why I want to make sure that you fully understand this. Now, if you see the output, the output is two words joined together with underscore, right? Now, the, the score that we have used is the aggregation, the summation, right? Now, let me just use some other score, let us say max. Okay, before that, let us also look at the length. So, what is the cardinality now? So, now the cardinality reduced from 7,000 to 2000 by doing this. Okay, now let me look at the max. So I will dynamically change it to max and run it again. Now look, look at the string here. So see here, now we have Edward, Rick, Dan. Look at before. You can see there is a difference. You can clearly see that there is a difference, okay? It is because we have taken a different measure, okay, different score to select the top two words, okay? So this might differ based on what you select, uh, but essentially uh, this is what we need to do. So now you see the cardinality is actually reduced from 7,000 to 3,000 but it is higher than 
the cardinality that we achieved in the previous one, which was 2000. So now we have 3000 cardinality. That means there are 1000 uh, records which are now unique, which were not, uh, which were not reflecting in the previous case. Now it's, uh, now it's reflecting. Okay. So I would say this is a hyperparameter, and you know you can play with it and that is what i have mentioned here that you guys can play with it and depending on the context of your problem statement this can be changed okay so let me revert back because uh, the cardinal cardinality is lower so for the demo purpose i'll go with the lower but it really depends on your business context. Okay, this is just uh, to give you uh, a snapshot of what it looks like after we have done this feature selection. Okay, similarly, we will take up the first three digits from the part number. So that is what it, it does. It basically takes the first three digits. I think this, we set it as three. So, we will run this okay and now if you look at the string so you will see only first three digits okay so the remaining so earlier it was uh, each id was having six digits and some of them were also having the dash so six digit dash maybe a couple of more digits so all that we have reduced to three digits and, uh, and we have reduced the cardinality here. Now, again, it really depends on how your organization assigns the ID. So it's always good to check, uh, you know, with your engineering department, how the IDs are created. Maybe there's a counter. Uh, maybe they have, uh, uh, you know, some starting suffix and prefix. Uh, to, to generate a particular ID for a product. So uh, understand, you know, what is uh, what is under the hood of the ID generation logic. And based on that, you can refine this logic. You know, you don't have to really select first three digits. So you can change the logic and show that uh, by changing that logic, you can capture the maximum information and you don't lose any information. Okay. Okay, so uh, it's now reduced to 470. So it's a quite a big reduction. Now what we are going to do, we are going to replace the product number and product description with these uh, new values that we have arrived. So that's what we are going to do here. Okay. Now if you see So if you look at the uh, structure now, you will see that the product description changed, right? Now it is one word with the underscore. Uh, the product number also changed. So that is what uh, we have done. Okay. Now what, what we also have in, in this data, actually I purposefully added that information. Uh, we also have this plant so this plant so if i look at say table tlf plan so you can see that sort of a dependencies so that means that the particular part or product is coming from three different plants right so that's how that's what it means and these plants are actually separated with the pipe uh, here. So we also have this, we may also have this kind of data where you have multiple location, you know, the part is coming to, and which is fairly reasonable because you may have, you know, different plants producing the same part. So you may have data like this, and that is what I purposefully, what I purposefully done here. Uh, so what we can do here is we can, sort of clean this up also and change it to the the long form so what i mean is that 
if you look at a uh, dimension of PL. So we have 18,379, right? But if we clean up this plant and change uh, this to the long form, and then the number of records will actually increase because we will have a sort of a new record added for every uh, plant code once we clean up. So that's what we're gonna do here. Okay, so what we have done here is we have split it, the data with the pipe uh, delimiter, and then we have sort of unnested. That means it will increase the size. Um, so all that data is stored in a new feature called plant new. So it's a handcrafted feature. And then later on, what I've done is I have renamed the plant new to the plant because this is what we are using in the downstream process. So it's like creating a new feature and then deleting an old feature and renaming the new feature to the old feature. So it's a little bit, a uh, little bit different. Okay. So now, if you look at the dim, you will see that from 18,000 it has increased to 19,000, which makes sense because some of the new rows are added after uh, splitting, uh, you know, these categories. Okay, so it looks good so far. Let's move on and let's uh, do a setup for model building. So what we're going to do here is we are going to build a multi-class application. Okay, so I'll extract the dependent feature. So that is nothing but um, the X feature and the outcome or the Y feature is called outcome. Okay, that's what I'm doing here. Okay, now uh, I will first show you the mean encoding and then I will tell you how the one hot encoding works because mean encoding is more important because that's where all the action lies okay so uh, the mean encoding how we're going to do it so um, so what we're going to do here is we are going to create so we have 35 categories right in this particular data so we are going to create the one hot encoding for those 35 okay so guys uh, i think we are maybe overshooting the time here so basically what we are going to do is we are going to create the mean encoding okay and uh, for that you know first let me create the one hot for the y vector so that i can map you know the mean every every feature to the category okay so that's what i'm doing here uh, so let me just run this first okay and then create the test and train partition okay so uh, we have created uh, the test and then and this is where we are going to create the mean encoding so this is the magic loop where we create the mean encoding so i told you that you know some uh, data leakage can happen so to overcome that we are going to add some noise so jitter is a function uh, which will help us add some noise so that's what we are going to do here Okay, so now it's calculating the mean encoding for our data set. Okay, and then we will remove uh, the one hot encoding that we had created in order to calculate the mean encoding. I think those columns are not necessary now, so we'll remove it. Okay, and then we have uh, the columns with the mean encoding. Now, in order to reduce the space further, we can calculate the correlation and uh, drop all the columns which have higher than 0.9 correlation absolute correlation so that's what we are going to do here okay okay and then uh, your algorithms uh, can be run. So XGBoost and so all these algorithms are right here. XGBoost, SVM, and then we can run the random forest and the GPM. So um, I, I'm not going to run these algorithms because running algorithms is a pretty straightforward process. I've already shown you the results of these algorithms. I think you can try it out 
on your own. There's one question, uh, metadata would be easier to comprehend. <clears throat> so yeah, I think we, we had that on the slide. What care is taken during generating new product categories? Okay, so the care is only two things you need to, to understand that uh, you capture the words which are not, which, which belong to the context and not very common words, right? So you make sure that you, you take care of that aspect. Also, you take care of the cardinality. So you try to reduce as much cardinality as possible. So these are the two things. If you take care, I think you are good. To. How mean encoding is different from PCA? Okay, so the PCA is uh, also a dimensional reduction technique. It will create the latent variables, right? And it will combine the effect of the variable into a, a, a particular latent variable, right? However, you cannot really define that latent variable. If you have to explain it to somebody, it's very difficult to explain, right? And you think about a space where you have 100 or 1,000 or 2,000 columns. It's not very clear how many uh, PCA components will be good to go because you know, after four or five PCA uh, components, you know, the remaining components may have uh, the explanatory, very less explanatory power, but still they may be, they might be useful for the con uh, in the business context. So the PCA has these type of inherent challenges. Okay, while the mean encoding, you are what you're doing is you are you are basically mapping the the category to the outcome. So it's very clear that, you know, how much dependency your category has with the outcome, with the number. So it's very easy to explain also to your business. Okay. And it also helps you uh, understand the whole context better and run faster. So that's what I would say about uh, the PCA versus mean encoding. And I would definitely go with mean encoding, target encoding uh, anytime as compared to the PCA. Okay, uh, does part number length reduction required? Yes, because the cardinality is huge. So you have to think of the ways, you know, how you can uh, overcome this challenge. And as I've told you that in my context, the first three numbers, first three digits were good enough to capture most of the information. But in your context, business context, it could be different, right? So understand how the part numbering is done in the organization. So you can go and talk to the engineering team or the product team. They will tell you the information. And based on that, you can change your approach. So why are we reducing cardinality of the part number? So the cardinality reduction, the main, the main reason to reduce cardinality is to reduce the size of your feature space. The higher the cardinality you have, the more number of features you're going to end up with, right? So you need to sort of uh, balance everything out here okay so if you have high number of features your model size will be bigger and it's very difficult to even ship it out to the customer right so uh, everything will actually uh, run slower if the size is bigger, bigger your uh, your analytics can actually run even slower than what you expect so so cardinality has a very important piece in this whole context Okay, so we have so far worked on existing data and created a model. What does the model accomplish in the real life? Okay, so model accomplishment is like, let's take an example. So if you have a tire, right? And tomorrow you have come up uh, uh, with, with a tire of a, with a different technology, right? So most of your other features of your tire will remain the same and it has to go into the tire category, right? So that's how you map that. This product with these features have to be mapped to a tire category, right? Now tomorrow, if you uh, end up creating some additional, you know, tire with some new technology, so you will have some extra piece of metadata added to it, right? Some extra description added to it. So you wanna make sure that it is also categorized as tire. If not, then, you know, categorize as 
uh, you know some some other category right so you want to make sure that your machine learning algorithm takes care of it automatically and maps it to the right category even if there is a slight deviation in the feature engineering even if the slight deviation in the number of features right so so that is what the uh, machine learning model will accomplish it will try to map your data to the right category so that it goes and sits at the right place and tomorrow if your business extract the information they get it at from from that place right away so that is what it does it's actually a huge uh, it makes a huge business impact the problem which i worked on uh, it was giving me 500 million dollars of impact and 1% to 2% model accuracy was making a big, big difference. Because if you have millions of data, 1% accuracy can actually improve your model performance. So you can maybe uh, categorize 10,000 products rightly as compared to, you know, other way. So if it is other way, you have to spend, spend you know, manual efforts to actually categorize them. So so it's it's a savings operational savings of both time and the cost so what type of challenges we may face from data analytics point of view in physical product industry like honeywell so this is a honeywell example okay so i have only uh, slightly simplified it and first the data so that i can put across the the concept to all of you but it is it is a Honeywell problem, and these are the type of challenges, you know, high cardinality of the data, the size, uh, the dynamic nature of the data. So all these things are, uh, and the accuracy, so all these things are the challenges uh, in this space, okay? All right, so TF-IDF is a pretty standard concept. I think you can go and, and look at, uh, at the Google. But what it does is it basically penalize the most common words, okay? The common words mean, let's say uh, you have, uh, let's take a simple example, you have 10 books and every book will have a word like the, uh, is, and, right? So those are all common words. So even though their frequency is high, but they are so common, they are actually not important for, for your context. You, if you want to summarize a particular article, you don't want these type of words unnecessarily, even though their frequency is very high, right? So TF-IDF actually penalizes the common words and give you a score where you can extract the most important words or the most important knowledge from the context, okay? So this is the TF-IDF and that's what we have used here. Uh, we are not using stemming or lemmatization, yes. So stemming and lemmatization you can use it really depends on your uh, business context. But in my case, uh, it was not necessary because these, these names were pretty, pretty standard. These are all uh, techie names, right? You will not find these type of names if you look for a public domain uh, text, right? Public domain text will be full of trivia and stories and and maybe uh, some, some those sort of things, but you will not find terms like so easily like ball bearing and so on. So, so lemmatization was not necessary for me, but uh, you can actually use it uh, if, let us say, you're working on an e-commerce platform where you have very pretty standard names. So I think you can use it. It, it definitely makes sense. So what is CAT PCA when to use this? Can you also share the process of doing so? Well, I have not, I have not written the code for CAT PCA here. But CAT PCA is uh, similar to the PCA. Basically, you are trying to look at the quadrant and discordant aspect because they are all binary variables, right? Zero and one. Uh, and then you are trying to combine, you know, the features into a latent feature. So that's what it does. It's pretty much the same. But since it is a binary variable, so their treatment is slightly different. If you uh, uh, do a Google with CAT PCA, I think you will find uh, a lot of articles and you can go through that, okay? Okay, if we add more product categories in future, how should we take it? So if you are adding new products, so that means uh, your existing model will 
categorize them into other category, right? So you may have a, sort of a blanket category called other category where uh, you, you want to push all your new products. So that's what you can do as a first step. Uh, so you can define a, a category called others and whatever data it does not match with the existing categories, you can push, the machine learning will push into the others. Um, and then over a period of time, you can look at uh, that category and, and then refine your model. So model creation is not a static process. It does not stop once you build the model, right? It is an ongoing process. So refinement has to happen every month, every week, depending on your business context. So for example, in aeros aerospace industry, we refine the model every, almost every two months. And I've, I've known some industry where they refine the model every two weeks, okay? So this is one way. Uh, you can keep track of those new categories and you can refine your model and uh, revise your model and it will work. The second way is to use uh, neural networks. So in neural networks, you have embedding, right? So embeddings are nothing but sort of converting text to, to numeric, okay? So even if you have a new category, I think it'll assign, uh, it'll assign some, some embedding automatically. And then based on the embedding, it will assign to a, uh, to a category which is closely matching with that embedding. So you can use neural networks in those cases, but I think you will still have to, to refine your model. So refining model is the key here. Uh, which model got the highest accuracy and R square in this product classification which suits best? So a classification, uh, I think R square is for regression. So if you talk about classification, yeah, you can check the accuracy. So in our context, as I've showed you here, uh, let me show you again. So in our context, I think um, the random forest actually worked uh, quite well. So if you look at the random forest, the test accuracy is 0.83, which is the highest across uh, all other models. And if you look at the test versus train, I think uh, the diversion is not huge, okay? Mm -hmm. So still the test and train scores are pretty close. So I don't see that there is a, there's an overfitting here. So random forest might be the best. And the next best is the cat boost mean encoding. And that is what is here. So here the test and train both uh, have almost similar accuracy and uh, overall accuracy is also high, you know, 0.815, which is the next best. So you can say in our context, random forest and cat boost with the mean encoding works the best. This brings us to the end of this tutorial on product categorization using machine learning. Now, before you guys sign off, I'd like to inform that we have launched a completely free platform called Create Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI cloud and digital marketing. So thank you very much for attending the session and have a great learning ahead.